again, we're at the last chapter, executive function. So the notion of an executive raises this question of like, who's in charge of your brain, right? Uh, and the answer that we get from cognitive neuroscience is essentially prefrontal cortex. We'll see that this is a overly simplistic answer, but it does have a lot of underlying truth value as well. The prefrontal cortex has been associated with uh, cognitive control, planning, motivation, reward processing, and decision making. These are things that we've talked about previously. And what we're going to try to do in this chapter is really try to understand where these come from and try to break down this concept of what is an executive. You know, how does it, how does that work? What does that mean? How do we understand these different functions as arising from underlying neural tissue? Uh, first of all, we can start off as we usually do with thinking about the biology. The prefrontal cortex is composed of several different areas. So the most uh, kind of largest in humans is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Motor areas which are uh, present in most animals with a cortex uh, and they're responsible for top-down control or sequencing of motor action. Ventromedial, going back into the medial wall, so this is kind of a lateral view of the frontal cortex, and here we have a, a more medial slice down the middle of the brain. Um, you have uh, these kind of more uh, affective motivational systems in the frontal cortex. And then you have this very interesting brain structure called the cingulate cortex, which has the anterior portion in the frontal cortex and then the posterior portion back in posterior cortex, um, and it has some, some unique cell types and plays a very important role in both uh, parts of the brain, the frontal and the posterior part of the brain, which we'll talk about. And again, the key question is, what makes this system tick? How do we understand it from a, a kind of really mechanistic level? One really important idea that gets us started is top-down biasing. And this is a really basic idea that says if you're going to be an executive control system in the brain, you need to be in a position to exert kind of influence over neural processing elsewhere in the brain. And so these are issues of connectivity and also, perhaps less obviously, uh, an ability to sustain activity over time to drive that top down activity. Okay, even though you may not appreciate, uh, you know, your boss. Um, there is a, a boss day and this notion of having somebody boss you around, maybe not so pleasant if you're a worker, but on the other hand, you know, the boss theoretically is there kind of keeping people on task, providing kind of top-down incentive. You may get fired if you don't do your job, those kind of things. Um, and so that kind of uh, process also does need to happen in the brain. You need some way of coordinating all the different specialized brain areas throughout the cortex and subcortical areas and have those systems kind of coordinate and, and synchronize their processing. That involves also a sense of uh, what is the bottom line, what's important, what's not important, and that uh, also comes from this notion of an executive or a boss, uh, someone who is in touch with the overall finances of the uh, company and who really is concerned with that kind of bottom line issues, you know, what, what's going to make the, the company survive or thrive. Um, and so in the cortex, that also, you know, ties in with all the connections with the motivational and affective system in the prefrontal cortex in those ventral and medial areas. So this idea is basically universally accepted that, that the prefrontal cortex does have this kind of broad connectivity. It's in a position at the top of the cortical hierarchy to provide this kind of top-down biasing, but it doesn't really answer all the questions because you sort of need to know, well, what makes that boss so smart, right? And this is kind of what we can describe as the homunculus problem where essentially, you know, you have some explanation for this intelligent cognitive behavior that essentially amounts to the idea that you have intelligence in a part of your brain. And that means you haven't really explained where that intelligence comes from. It's more like, okay, yeah, so what makes that part of the brain so intelligent? Well, it must have some secret prefrontal cortex as well that makes it intelligent. 
And so you get this infinite regress problem. Turtles all the way down is this famous saying, the earth resting on the back of the turtle. And then, well, what is that turtle standing on? And then it's turtles all the way down. So we really need to have some mechanistic explanation that avoids this infinite regress and allows us to understand why the frontal cortex can be smart in a way that doesn't appeal to being smart. Our explanation that we're going to pursue here is in fact that you know you just like in many cases you need to break the problem down into smaller parts and see how all of those different components work together in an emergent way to create intelligence. So here in blue we have the classic sensory motor kind of you know posterior cortex uh, this ability to process sensory input, turn it into high-level internal representations that support useful kinds of motor actions and an ability to you know, perform those actions, guide them through sensory input information, etc. So this is kind of the core of like, you know, your cognitive abilities, right? But on top of that, you have this prefrontal cortex, again, providing a top-down biasing uh, selecting what it is that we should be doing at any given moment, paying attention to, uh, we call this kind of task, task-based attention, you know, this kind of top-down goal-driven attention. There's lots of different terms that people use to try to describe what prefrontal cortex is, is providing. But then the prefrontal cortex itself is not acting alone. It has a lot of help in the form of the basal ganglia. And we talked a lot about in the motor chapter how the basal ganglia gets to learn from dopamine to essentially learn kind of what is a good thing to do, what's gonna to lead to high levels of reward, what's a bad thing gonna to lead to punishment, uh, negative outcomes. And so the basal ganglia plays a critical role in conjunction with the prefrontal cortex to decide essentially what actions, what plans, what goals are gonna be uh, useful and so that's a big part of the intelligence is actually learning over time what actually works and what doesn't work. Through these kind of systems interacting, uh, you get an emergent ability to come up with good plans and actions that then guide the system towards useful behavior. And the bottom line is the real way that you get rid of the homunculus is through learning, right? So this is, this is inevitably how we get rid of kind of the mystery of uh, the magic of cognition is, well, you know, you start out as a baby and you're not so smart. <laughs> and eventually through a lot of hard fought experience and hard won experience, you get smarter and smarter over time through learning. It's that simple. And we need to understand those learning processes. And again, we did a lot about that in the motor chapter. So we know about phasic dopamine and how that trains up the basal ganglia. And so we'll see how that fits into the larger picture of this kind of top-down biasing system and how that all together integrates and combines and produces some kind of emergent executive intelligence.